Now you may remember from a few weeks ago that in the previous passage, in, in, in verse 16, Paul writes, Let no one pass judgment on you in questions of food and drink, or with regard to a festival or a new moon or a Sabbath. And now in this morning's passage, in verse 18, he writes, Let no one disqualify you, insisting on asceticism and worship of angels, going on in detail about visions, puffed up without reason by his sensuous mind. And you can hear the parallel between the two verses. Don't let anyone pass judgment on you. Don't let anyone disqualify you. The words are different, and yet the meaning between those two words are connected. To be disqualified is to be judged out of bounds. To have been judged to be doing something wrong, if it's some sort of a competition, a sports competition, or something like that. Paul is still very much on the subject of the false teachers that had come into their midst, of whom he has heard reports. And he continues his warning against the false standards that they want to impose. Not only were these false teachers wanting the Colossian Christians to observe Jewish ceremonial rites and dietary practices from the Old Testament, as we saw from the previous passage a few weeks ago, they also want them to add some pagan worship practices into the mix. And so Paul mentions asceticism and worship of angels, which were common practices among the people who lived around Colossae in Asia Minor. Inscriptions have been found in the cities of Claros and Laodicea, which speak of men being initiated into groups that had these practices. And so apparently the Judaizing false teachers had incorporated some of the local flavor into their religious practice that they were trying to spread among the churches in that area. It's known as syncretism. And you can hear the, hear the, the, the sound there, syncretism, synchronicity, synchronized. It's the blending of two disparate things. And in religion, syncretism is a bad thing. You see it all over the place where Roman Catholic, the Roman Catholic Church pushed out into new areas and they incorporated the various local deities into, uh, into their system of religion. But Paul counters this false teaching by telling the Colossians that true religious growth comes from Jesus Christ and from him alone, not from any kind of practices that they might have adopted to make them feel more religious. I think about much of Christian publishing today, not all of it, but much of Christian publishing today consists of books about how to be a better, a stronger, a more radical Christian. And often they promise to convey secret knowledge that contains the key to a successful Christian life. If you just do these three things, and it sounds so wonderful, a step-by-step -step guide to how to improve yourself and become the Christian you've always wanted to be. It sounds wonderful, brothers and sisters. But it's not so different from what these ancient uh, false teachers were promising back in Paul's day. But Paul keeps it simple. And he makes it clear that what they need to know about life in Christ is available to everyone who professes faith in Christ. And that brings us to the major point that I want you to keep in mind as we work our way through the sermon this morning. If, by having faith in Jesus Christ, you are connected to him as your head, you will grow to full maturity in your faith. If, by having faith in Jesus Christ, you are connected to him as your head, you will grow to full maturity in your faith. The sermon is divided into three parts. The first part is mystics, ascetics, and heretics. The second part, an entrance to entrancement. And the third, Christ is formed in you. The first, mystics, ascetics, and heretics. The second, an entrance to entrancement. And the third, Christ is formed in you. So let's look at the first part of the sermon, the first point, mystics, ascetics, and heretics. In the first phrase in verse 18, Paul writes, let no one disqualify you. Paul is saying they should not let any of the false teachers in Colossae try to tell them that they are disqualified for not following their strict and mystical regimen. He's not saying that they could possibly actually be disqualified, but he's saying that these false teachers will try to convince them that they're disqualified if they're not doing what the false teachers tell them they are doing. I would guarantee you, though I don't know it, but if we were there, if we could be transported back, I would guarantee you that money is involved. <laughs> the false teachers were wanting money from these Colossian Christians. And they'd figured out a secret way to get it out of them. 
But Paul is telling the Colossians to disregard them. Don't be disqualified by them. Just disregard what they're saying to you. If, if they are in Christ, if the Colossian Christians are in Christ, they have the substance while these men are peddling shadows. He says in verse 18 that these men insist on asceticism and worship of angels. Now, asceticism, that's a word that some of you have heard of. Some of you may not be familiar with it. It's the practice of extreme self-denial or taking pleasure in self-abasement. And some English versions translate it as self-abasement. Others, voluntary humility. Now, there's a form of humility or self-abasement in the Bible that's godly and good. But the context here shows that, that that isn't what Paul is talking about. He's talking about a humility that is for show. A humility that's intended to be seen by others. And I ask you, is that really humility? Does humility want to be seen for the good that you're doing? No, that's not humility. That's pride. That's arrogance. It's just dressed up as humility. This is doing religion in order to be recognized by others as very spiritual. For instance, consider the godly biblical practice of fasting. Fasting is promoted in the Bible as something that Christians ought to do on certain occasions, even in the OPC, in our book of, 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 uh, church, uh, our book of church order. It talks about when someone is installing, uh, ordaining and installing a new minister, that the church, it's, it's, it, it is well, it's good for the church to spend that day in fasting and prayer. It's a solemn occasion. And fasting is a way not only that you mark the solemnity of the occasion, but also that you, you set it apart and you recognize. It, it helps you to recognize the, the seriousness of what is going on. But Jesus had some strong words about the type of fasting that's done for show. And in our scripture reading from Matthew 6, Jesus tells his disciples, And when you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites, for they disfigure their faces, that their fasting may be seen by others. They want to be seen in their practice of religion. This type of religiosity, it sees other people as the audience for whom you perform. It's done as a show. But we need to recognize that there is only one person who is the audience for all that we do, for all of our worship. It, it, we worship not to be seen by our brothers and sisters here at Mid-Cities. You're out there uh, in the pews worshiping not to be seen by your pastor. I'm up here not worshiping to be seen by y'all. We're worshiping before the audience of the Lord God. He is the only one who we ought to be concerned about as we worship. And so Jesus tells his disciples that when they fast, they're to anoint their heads, they're to wash their faces, and this is to be done so that others don't know that they're fasting. And Jesus promises his disciples that their father who is in secret will see it. We see this in our day in the observance of Lent. And I hope, I, I'm going to lay it out there, brothers and sisters. I hope none of you, back before Easter, you, you marked the day, Fat Tuesday, and then, and then Wednesday. I hope you didn't start an observance of Lent. I, I, I hope you didn't. Because that is, that is an extraneous trapping of religion that is itself a trap. And it does you no good. But th there are many Christians, many professing believers who, who've adopted this practice, not only in the Roman Catholic Church, but outside of it. There are more and more uh, people who are posting about it on social media. For, for Lent this year, I'm giving up this. When you're fasting, don't make a big show of it, says the Lord. Now, most of us don't fast as often as we ought to. And that's true, speaking only for myself and extrapolating out from there, I don't fast nearly as often as I ought to. But when we do, when you do, when I do, it should be something between you and the Lord and as few others as possible. Your family members, so they don't think something's going on, or something's wrong. Why are you not eating? Now, you probably ought to let your family members know, but you don't need to make a big show of it to everyone else in your uh, circle of friends. That was the Lord's problem with his people's fasts in the passage in Isaiah 56, which we read right before the service. They put on a good show of religion. If you read the verses leading up to what's at the top of your bulletins there, they put on a great show of religion. They did fasts like nobody else could do fasts. But what does the Lord say to them? They haven't had a concern or a care for the needy, the poor, the naked, the starving among them. They don't care about them. They turn a blind eye to their needs. 
They go on about their life. They show how great and religious they are. And the Lord holds them in contempt because they simply don't care. Their religion is empty. They don't care. The Lord tells them in that passage that it wasn't their fasting that showed that their faith was true, but sharing their bread with the hungry, bringing the homeless poor into their houses, clothing the naked, and not going into hiding when they see someone in need. Well, in our passage, Paul also mentions the worship of angels, which was a thing in his day. Angels are powerful, glorious beings, and if we saw one, we would probably feel the urge to bow down like John in the book of Revelation. But angels are creatures, too. But these false teachers were trying to make the worship of angels a requirement for the Christian faith. And according to Beale, the, the voluntary humbling or asceticism was the preparation for the worship of angels. He draws a connection between the practice of fasting in the Old Testament and seeing heavenly visions in such places as Daniel chapter 10. And so for these ascetics, the way that they achieved the heavenly visions in which they were able to worship the angels and gain this sense of superiority over everyone else was through extended periods of fasting, which left them in a delusional state. And again, anyone can do that if they want to cut off food for long enough. All of this, in the minds of these false teachers, placed them in a superior position to other so-called Christians who hewed more closely to the ordinary. And that brings us to the second part of the sermon, an entrance to entrancement. The first few clauses of verse 18 build up to what he says in the next clause, which the ESV translates as going on in detail about visions. And, and Beale in his commentary says that this phrase has the most controverted word in the whole epistle. And he's referring to the word that the ESV translates as detail, a translation that Beale takes issue with. He doesn't think that's, in fact, he thinks that's the worst translation of the word. Without going into great detail here, I simply can't. I have to rely upon Beale himself. But he says that the ESV's rendering is the least likely option since its meaning is possibly attested in only one place throughout uses in various ancient sources, including uh, the Septuagint, the, the Greek Old Testament, the version of the Old Testament. Only one place might it possibly be used in the way that the ESV chose to translate it. I don't know why they made that choice to translate it as detail, but they did. But Beale says that's not really the most preferable translation for it. He says the most preferable translation is something along the lines of entering into the innermost sanctuary. And if you think about that for a moment, it fits with the previous clause in verse 18. Because it's in this so-called sanctuary that the visions of angels and worship of them are to be had. The false teachers are telling the Colossians that they found the entrance to becoming entranced. If this is the correct translation, then Paul seems to be referring to a practice of initiation in which the participants, they, they fast for so long, they become delusional, they enter into some kind of ecstatic frenzy, and they have these visions. And in their system of belief, this renders the person who experience it a super-Christian. They attain a status above the ordinary hoi polloi in Christianity. Now, it's doubtful that we at Mid-Cities are in danger of falling into this type of Christianity. We're not striving to achieve any kind of second blessing of the Spirit that would result in speaking in tongues or of prophetic or beatific visions. We're, we're, that's, not our, that's not our bag. If anything, the particular danger we may face is a, is a severe austerity that borders on asceticism. The OPC is caricatured as being humorless, cold, and buttoned up. And oftentimes caricatures have at least a grain of truth to them. And for us, because we place such a high value on knowledge and grasping the finer points of doctrine, there is a real danger of becoming puffed up, of becoming conceited, of becoming arrogant. Paul concludes verse 18 with this. He says, puffed up without reason by, the, by his sensuous mind. And the word puffed up is translated in 1 Corinthians 4, uh, verse 18, 1 Corinthians 5, verse 2, and 1 Corinthians 13, verse 4, as arrogant. These entrancements that the false teachers are urging the Colossian Christians to, 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 to experience, they have resulted in the false teachers becoming arrogant, boastful, but, not, but, but for no reason, as Paul puts it. 
Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 1 to 3, Now concerning food offered to idols, we know that all of us possess knowledge. And this knowledge, he says in, in scare quotes, puffs up. But love builds up. If anyone imagines that he knows something, he does, he does not yet know as he ought to know. But if anyone loves God, he is known by God. The most important kind of knowledge is being known by God. It's not how much you know, but by whom you are known. And I would encourage you, brothers and sisters, for those of you who are inclined in such a way as to gain as much knowledge as you can, which is a wonderful thing, but be careful. Knowledge does puff up. It's easy to become arrogant. The more you know, the, the easier it can be if you're lacking in any humility, humility to the smallest degree, the easier it becomes to look down upon those who don't have that knowledge. But some people simply are not capable of attaining that knowledge. There are people in this world who are smarter than you and I are, vastly more brilliant than the most brilliant mind here. That doesn't make them any better than someone for, for whom developmentally they can't understand basic doctrines, but they love the Lord Jesus Christ. And so the kind of knowledge that is gained through these angelic visions is not what we are called to as followers of Christ. We are simply to hold fast to Christ our head. And that brings us to the third and the final point of the sermon. Christ is formed in you. In verse 19, Paul critiquing the false teachers, he says this, and speaking of them, he says, and not holding fast to the head, from whom the whole body, nourished and knit together through its joints and ligaments, grows with a growth that is from God. Christ is the head of the church, meaning that he's the church's authority. He is the one who directs us. He's the one who tells us what to do. He rules over his church. But that's not the extent of what the word head means. Christ is also the source of our life. Now think about this for a moment. Think about the, the mighty Mississippi River. How many of you, you don't have to raise your hand, how many of you crossed the Mississippi River? You've seen it in its grandeur. It's, it's a beautiful, it's an amazing river. It's, it's the fourth longest river in the world. It's, it's a very wide and majestic, slow flowing river. I don't remember, the, I can't even comprehend the, the, the metric volume that flows through it every single day. But the headwaters of the Mississippi River are found in northern Minnesota, in Itasca State Park. This is the origination point, the, the source of the mighty Mississippi. In Itasca State Park, the Mississippi is an 18-foot-wide, knee-deep river that flows out of Lake Itasca. Now, this summer, our family had the opportunity to cross the Mississippi a few times, first going from Missouri into Illinois and then coming back home, and then the second time from Arkansas into Tennessee and then returning back home from that trip. By the point the Mississippi reaches the Interstate 40, heading into Memphis, hundreds, perhaps thousands of, of tributaries, smaller rivers, creeks, streams have flowed into the Mississippi River so that it has grown exponentially larger in width and depth. By the time it reaches the mouth, that is down in Louisiana at New Orleans, it's over 200 feet deep and massively wide. However, Unlike the Mississippi, Christ is the sole source for a Christian's growth in Christ. The growth, though spiritual, though, is no less exponential. And so Paul gives a picture here of, of a baby in the womb. He says that growth comes from the head. Being nourished and knit together, it flows down. And he adds that this growth, it comes from God. And of course, Christ is God, so the source is one and the same. And Paul uses a similar, similar analogy elsewhere. For instance, in Galatians chapter 4, 19, where he writes, My little children, for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in you. And in that letter as here, Paul is concerned because false teachers have crept into their midst. False teaching, false teachers are the norm for the church. They come in. The false teaching there in Galatia was a little different than, uh, than it was in Colossia, in Colossia in some ways, but it was still, it still contained an addition to the gospel. It was the gospel plus, faith plus. Like the formation of a baby in the womb, the formation of the disciples of Jesus Christ takes time. 
And those of you who have been a believer for a while, you know this. It takes a lifetime to be conformed to the image and the likeness of Jesus. But Paul here isn't just speaking to individuals. He's speaking to them as a group, a collective, the church, the body of Christ. And the pronoun for you in the original is in the plural form. And so he's speaking to all of them. My little children for whom I am again in the anguish of childbirth until Christ is formed in y'all, he says. And so what does it mean to have Christ formed in you? Well, first and most importantly, we need to remember that it is God's work to form Christ in a church. During Paul's ministry in Galatia, he saw God's work of drawing people to Christ and forming them into one body. And when he left, he thought things were well on their way. But now, after his departure, these false teachers have crept in. He is again in anguish of childbirth. Forming the body of Christ in a group of believers is the work of God. A group of individual believers is knit together into a unified body. You share each other's joys. You share each other's sorrows. The same spirit that dwells in your heart dwells in your brothers' and sisters' hearts. But this knitting together, this making the one out of the many, it's a fragile process. One that can be interrupted or stopped just like the knitting together of a baby in her mother's womb. And that's what Paul is dealing with in this letter. Men who were teaching a false gospel, they had infiltrated these churches, and their teacher, teachings were threatening the formation of those churches. So what's the remedy? Well, jumping for a moment from Paul to Peter, Peter writes in 1 Peter 2, verses 1 to 5, So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. Like newborn infants, long for the pure spiritual milk, that by it you may grow up into salvation, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is good. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. In that context, Peter makes it clear that they were born again through the living and abiding word of God. And that is the pure spiritual milk of which he speaks in chapter 2, verse 2. The pure spiritual milk of God's word is what will form Christ in you. It is what will make you who are many one. Now there is a sense in which we, we need to move on from exclusively drinking milk to the solid food of the faith, meaning that our faith should deepen and mature, but we never outgrow our need for the pure spiritual milk of God's word. We never outgrow our need for the gospel, the simple gospel. By faith in Jesus Christ, we who are vitally connected to our head have him as our authority. And it is from him that we grow. He is our source. He nourishes us. He knits us together. And he does so primarily through that which is ordinary. The ordinary means of grace, the word, the sacraments, prayer. If you are in him, if you are vitally connected to him, if you have true faith in Jesus Christ, you will grow up into full maturity. Christ won't leave you to languish because you don't have some kind of ecstatic religious experience. He is gracious. He is good. He causes you to grow in him. And that, brothers and sisters, is good news. Amen.